All right, everybody, welcome. Uh, we're going to get started in a few minutes. Uh, and today we have our BD at home um, with the Pacific Museum of Earth. We have uh, Daniel joining us. So there he is waving. <laughs> so uh, we'll get started in a few minutes. Um, I also just wanted to mention that this is being streamed on Facebook as well. So um, uh, we'd prefer if you turned your videos off um, so that your your image is not being uh, shared far and wide on several platforms. Awesome, thank you. Uh, but we will uh, you know, take questions and comments. So uh, we'll be using the chat box for that. Daniel, we've already got a question. Um, <laughs> so the question just so, uh, so I'll say it out loud. So uh, how many types of rocks are there? Uh, so it depends on how you want to count. Uh, there are three main categories of rocks, uh, igneous, metamorphic, and uh, sedimentary rocks. Um, but if you're talking about like individual, um, I guess in the biodiversity sense, you could say species of rocks, uh, it really depends on um, which geologist you're talking to. Um, just like biology, there's sometimes debates as to whether uh, you include two types of rocks under the same umbrella, or whether you split them up. Um, and I see Kashva smiling because I think uh, she knows that sometimes this happens. Um, yeah, <laughs> does that make any sense? Yeah, uh, and we can talk more about that later too. We're almost at one o'clock, so okay. we'll be getting started with the Be at Home very soon. That's great that we're already getting questions. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I think we'll get started. We're almost at one o'clock. So, hey everybody, welcome. Uh, we're doing our BD at home today and uh, we're going to be hearing from Daniel from the Pacific Museum of Earth, which is a sister museum of, of the BD. Um, and they have lots of really cool fossils and rocks and everything in between. So Daniel will be telling us all about that. Um, we are also, uh, sharing to Facebook as well. So perhaps you're joining us from there. Welcome. Uh, I will just do a quick little introduction, let you know uh, all the faces and voices you're going to be seeing and hearing. Um, so we have Daniel joining us. There he is. <laughs> He's the Education and Outreach Coordinator and Assistant Curator at the Pacific Museum of Earth. Uh, my name is Kashfa. I'll be uh, I'll be hosting and I will uh, take your questions. And then we've also got Sheila Byers, who is also an interpreter here at the museum. She will also be taking your questions. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes doing a land acknowledgement and giving you an introduction to the BD Biodiversity Museum. So uh, where is the BD Museum uh, located. Uh, we are on the traditional unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam people. Um, I've included uh, the website of, of the Musqueam if you'd like to check that out. And I also have the link for the First Peoples Map of BC here. So wherever you live uh, in the province, you can uh, use that resource to, to see the traditional territory you're on. This is where we are on a map. The BD Museum is at the University of British Columbia right here. We are currently open. We're open Tuesdays to Sundays, 10 to 5. Um, and we're really close to a lot of other attractions that are currently open. The Museum, Museum of Anthropology, the Belkin Art Gallery, the Botanical Garden, and of course, the Pacific Museum of Earth, which is currently not open, but uh, they are right across the street from us. Um, this is what the museum looks like when you come, uh, come down Main Mall. Um, and of course, we can see the biggest specimen uh, in the museum right in front of you. If you were actually looking in the opposite direction, uh, you would see the Pacific Museum of Earth. So that's how close we are to the PME. Um, the BD Biodiversity Museum is, is part of the Biodiversity Research Center. And uh, there are over 50, uh, 50 uh, faculty uh, that are here in the research center. They're studying all aspects of biodiversity. And you can see some of the organisms that they're studying here on this poster. So you can see there's some people studying sunflowers and algae, seahorses, uh, all kinds of fish, all kinds of birds. Um, so lots of research happening here. And the last thing I'll tell you about is, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> the, the last thing 
uh, are the, the six different collections in our museum. So we looked at the blue whale earlier. That is just one specimen here at the museum. And in total, we've actually got over 2.1 uh, million things at the museum. So lots of really cool things to see. And they're divided into these six collections that you see on your screen. So from the top left, we've got the tetrapods, birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. We've got marine invertebrates, things in the ocean without a backbone. Um, so all kinds of things with shells, coral, jellyfish, and so on. Uh, next, we've got the herbarium with plants and plant-like things, and things that are not plants but look like plants, like fungi. Insects and their close relatives, fish, and the fossil collection. Um, and this fossil collection actually belongs uh, to the, the PME. The, the BD and the PME work on this together. And that is a great segue to hand it over to Daniel. <laughs> so Daniel, feel free to share, share your screen. Absolutely. Uh, let's just, oh. Oh, oh boy. I have Stop sharing mine. There we go. <laughs> oh, there we go. Let's try this. Okay. So welcome everyone to the Pacific Museum of Earth, um, our virtual tour. Um, I should say, first of all, uh, that I'm not actually at the Pacific Museum of Earth right now. Uh, what you see behind me is actually a fake background, but it's just supposed to show you uh, what the museum looks like. Um, you can see we've got our inflatable dinosaur behind me, uh, who was visiting us uh, about a year ago. So that is a historical photograph, not a current one. Um, if I were at the museum today, I would need to be wearing a mask uh, because as of today, uh, when we're indoors at uh, UBC spaces, we do have to wear masks uh, in public spaces. Um, okay, feel free to let us know where you're uh, visiting us from. Um, and feel free to ask lots and lots of questions. Uh, we'll be having about three uh, different sections and we'll have a spot for uh, questions and answers afterward. I also have to thank the BD for giving us this uh, venue and opportunity to present the PME to all of you. Um, the BD has always been a great partner to, with the PME and um, they also really helped us a lot with designing this tour. Um, you may notice some similar slides. <laughs> So this is the main gallery of the Pacific Museum of Earth. Uh, you can see our main mascot, George, the dinosaur, mounted on the wall over there. Uh, you can also see that our building is full of many different labs and researchers. And that's one of the reasons why the museum is still closed. Um, the main, research, or the main um, focus is to get researchers back into those labs and doing their really interesting science. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the museum, uh, just isn't uh, the priority. We, we do want to help those researchers uh, do their science safely and securely. Um, and so out of respect for them, we have kept the museum closed, but we are trying to expose people to the museum through events like this and through our brand new online tour. Uh, just like the Beatty, the Pacific Museum of Earth is located on the uh, unceded territory of the Musqueam people, uh, their, their traditional territory. We are located also at UBC, uh, almost just across the street from the Beattie Biodiversity Museum. So if you ever go to the Beattie, feel free to pop across the street and look through our windows. You'll be able to see our, uh, some of our displays. Right across the street from the Beattie Biodiversity Museum is this brand new building. And we have some satellite displays there, like our hallway of human evolution, our elasmosaur, our display showing the evolution of Earth. But our main galleries are mostly in this much older building, which is kind of hidden behind this newer building. So here you can see our front door, which is kind of hard to find sometimes. We are the Museum of the Department of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences. This is the largest department in UBC's Faculty of Science, and it's a very diverse department. Uh, we are very diverse in terms of our research. We have Atmospheric scientists, those are people who study what's going on in the air above us at different levels. Uh, they may study the stuff that's in the atmosphere, the composition of the atmosphere, the pressure of the atmosphere. Uh, we've got climate scientists. Uh, we're all very aware uh, that the climate is changing very quickly right now, especially um, when being inundated with smoke from the fires 
uh, which are blazing because of climate change down south. Um, climate, change, or climate science is very, very important to us right now. Uh, we've got geochemists. Geochemistry, I admit, doesn't sound like the most exciting field, but it really is uh, quite uh, interesting and bizarre in some cases. Uh, I was recently talking to one of our, our geochemists, uh, Dominique Weiss, and she's researching uh, urban pollutants in urban honey hives. So she takes honey from urban hives, uh, looks at the trace elements uh, of different chemicals and uses that to map urban pollution. Her science is so uh, fine and minute that she was able to trace the smoke plume from when Notre Dame caught fire across Paris by tracing the lead isotopes from that fire in different urban hives. Um, we've got uh, glaciologists. They study glaciers. <laughs> we've got um, hydrologists. So I was recently talking to a hydrologist who'd studied uh, groundwater in the, uh, just off the Bay of Bengal, uh, northern BC, and Peru. We've got loads of oceanographers. Um, we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the ocean. So uh, there's a lot for us to study in the ocean. And we've got planetary scientists. It's bizarre to think of an earth scientist department having planetary scientists, people who look at other planets, but we've spent a lot of time and energy getting to learn how different features on our planet formed. And so we can now take that knowledge and apply it to other planets. If we see those same features on another planet, uh, we can make a good guess as to how those features on those other planets were formed. Uh, one of our scientists, um, Catherine Johnson, recently landed the InSight probe on Mars. She was the only Canadian scientist involved in that project, and that probe is looking for Mars quakes, similar to an earthquake. But let's get to the museum. The museum is divided into four main categories. Ancient life, or fossils. Earth's treasures, or uh, minerals and gems. Our powerful planet or uh, natural disasters, and finally, the Omniglobe. So let's start with our first section, petrified wood. Uh, this is one of my favorite specimens in the museum's collection. This is a piece of semi-petrified wood from Nevada. It's about 225 million years old. Uh, this piece is semi-opalized, so opal has penetrated into the core of this piece of wood, but the really, oh, the, the really interesting uh, piece about this specimen is that the outside hasn't fossilized yet. The outside is still uh, cellulose or, or wood. Uh, we often think of uh, fossilization as having to take millions and millions of years to occur, uh, but it really often takes much, much less. Uh, if you think of something like a petrified leaf or um, I've seen petrified jellyfish, you can imagine if those took millions and millions of years to fossilize, they would decompose through natural processes. Instead, the process of petrification often occurs over a few months or a few years. Uh, opal is an amazing mineral for petrification or fossilization uh, because opal is carried through water really, really easily. Um, and so it can make some really beautiful uh, fossils like this one. Now let's talk about the definition of a fossil. There are two main types of fossils. Uh, fossils which are living things transformed into rock, and those are called body fossils, or evidence of life transformed into rock, and those are called trace fossils. Let's start with some of our oldest fossils, trilobites. Now trilobites are an incredibly common type of fossil. You find them all over the earth. Um, these are some trilobites uh, in our collection, and often you see nests of trilobites like this one. Trilobites were ancient sea bugs that would crawl across shallow sea floors eating dead stuff. They're incredibly diverse. Uh, the largest trilobite on earth was actually found on the shores of Hudson Bay. It is Canadian, I've seen it, um, and if it were to stand up, it would come up roughly to your knee. So take a close look at it and imagine all these tiny bug legs crawling up your leg just to say hello. Another great feature about trilobites are their complex eyes. So you can see it looks almost like a modern insect's eye. 
As I mentioned, trilobites are very diverse. Here's a really bizarre trilobite in our collection from Morocco. So again, you can see the many legs sticking out the sides. You can see those complex eyes on the head. And you can see this really strange head structure, which you see in a few trilobites. Here we have another nest of Moroccan trilobites. Morocco is famous around the world for producing a huge quantity and a huge variety of trilobites. We think that at one point, Morocco was under a shallow sea. And for some reason, something happened and that sea suddenly became incredibly toxic, killing off everything that was alive in that sea. Because everything died, there was nothing around to scavenge the bodies of these dead organisms. Anything that came along would just die as well. And so these bodies just sat around and had the time to be petrified and turned into rock. So even though it was a, a catastrophe, it's actually really good for us today because we have a, a really great snapshot, a detailed snapshot of ancient Morocco. This is another interesting feature with trilobites, with any fossil really. Uh, immediately after death, many organisms will have their tendons tighten up uh, and it will distort them into a, a, a death pose that they wouldn't have had in life. So the tendons are like your muscles, uh, the ligaments that hold your bones and, and your body together, really. So just like with your hand, you can imagine if your hand muscles tighten up, your hand will curl up into a ball, right? That's what happened here with our trilobite. Here you can see again the eyes, this is the head, and then the body curls around the back. So it curls up into a ball. It wouldn't have been a ball when it was alive. It's just after it died, it curled up into a ball and then was trapped in this shape. You'll see the same thing with certain dinosaurs where their neck tendons will pull their head back into a very unnatural shape. Um, if you're familiar with the Archaeopteryx or the Arcteryx logo, uh, that is an Archaeopteryx where the neck got pulled back into a very strange, very contorted, a very uncomfortable shape. Okay, let's move a little for further forward in time. Hey, Daniel, is it okay if we stop and take some questions? Oh, sure. Let's time? Go okay, yeah. So I just wanted to say there have been a few questions and comments so far, so I thought this would be a good time just to catch them. Yeah. Um, so uh, there was a question earlier uh, about rocks, mm -hmm. if moon rocks are different from earth rocks, and I was wondering if you knew that? You, you... Yes and no. <laughs> so um, basically the moon is covered with a lot of basalt. Uh, basalt is a really common rock here on earth. Um, as a kid, you probably knew it as lava rock. Um, so it's ba basically just cooled down lava. The moon was a part of earth at one point, uh, but it broke off about four and a half billion years ago. Uh, so moon and earth are kind of made of the same stuff. The thing is, the moon has been up there for about four and a half billion years. It's been exposed to a level of radiation that uh, our atmosphere protects us from. So those rocks have been altered slightly, but I wouldn't, again, it depends on who you talk to, whether you'd classify them as a separate rock uh, or the same type of rock. Awesome, thank you. Um, there's a comment from Catherine that Daniel is awesome, exclamation mark. That's great. <laughs> um, and then uh, there's, there's a question about, are you gonna talk about dinosaurs at all? Absolutely. Later. Okay. There's a question about dinosaurs, but maybe we can save that till then. And there's a quick question from Arnold about the PME and about George. Um, is the is this the same George as the foot that uh, that is found in the floor in at the Beatty Museum? So the foot that's on display at the Beatty Museum used to actually be on display at the PME, um, but it got damaged at one point. And so uh, for its own safety, we relocated it to the, the BD. Uh, they've got a far superior conservation uh, uh, staff and, and uh, lab, and so they repaired it. And then just to keep it safe, it's now on display at the BD, and we've got a replica on display uh, in the PME. Awesome. There was, um, there, I, I know you've already kind of mentioned this, but maybe you can summarize this again. So there is a question, how do things become fossilized? How do things become fossilized? That's an excellent question. Uh, there are many different ways for something to become fossilized. Uh, the way that I'm most familiar with, and I think it's a fairly common way, is if a body is lying in water or in, a, in some kind of medium that can carry minerals, uh, that medium, either water or sometimes gas, uh, 
will carry those minerals into the, the, the body or into the bones uh, through tiny micropores. Now the medium can flow freely through it, uh, but the minerals which are in that medium, in that water or in that gas, will start to collide with the molecules that make up the bone. Uh, those minerals will knock those molecules out of place, but then the minerals will get stuck in the exact same spot. So it's kind of like a Newton's cradle, uh, the game with the ball bearings on people's desk, where you let go of one ball bearing and they go back and forth, right? The minerals come along and they'll knock the molecules out of place, but then the minerals will get stuck in the exact same position. So bit by bit, a bone will get washed away molecule by molecule, but the fossil will get created in the exact same spot. Does that make sense? Awesome. Thank you for, thank you for answering that. That's great. That's all for now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So let's move a little further ahead in time uh, with Sigillaria. This is a recent donation to the museum. Uh, this is a Sigillaria from Joggins, Nova Scotia, which is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So you're not actually allowed to uh, collect fossils there without a permit any, anymore. Now, what is a Sigillaria? It's an ancient tree or a proto tree. Uh, from the Carboniferous period. This is a really bizarre tree and I find it absolutely fascinating. With trees today, most of their structural support comes from inside their trunk, comes from the wood. But this tree wasn't filled with wood, it was filled with pith. Pith is that white stuff you find uh, between the, uh, the, um, the peel of an orange and the fruit, uh, that stuff that you're always peeling away. It allows uh, water and nutrients to flow up and down the, the trunk of the tree. The main structural support of this tree is the outside. So the outside of this tree is marked with a bunch of little pock marks arranged in a spiral pattern. And those pock marks are actually scars from dead leaves. So you can see it's got fresh brand new leaves at the top, but at the bottom of the, the leaf clump, they're older dead leaves. They'll age and die and fall off and leave behind these scars. Paleontologists will often find small pieces of a fossil and they have to be detectives to determine what the entire organism looked like. Uh, it helps if you can find a much larger specimen like this one where you can see how a small piece like this would fit into the entire organism. Now, Sigillaria lived during the Carboniferous period, a period when the planet was very hot and very humid. Uh, the climate was very, very different than it is today. Um, climate change, or the climate does naturally change, but this climate change that, that we're looking at here uh, took a few hundred million years. The climate change that we're seeing today is occurring far too fast to be uh, purely natural. Um, so there is evidence that humans are, are driving it. Now, at this time, with all these uh, swamps, when many organ organisms died, they wouldn't decompose properly. Swamps aren't great for decomposition. Instead, they would get compressed uh, in these swamps, and over uh, millions of years, they would turn into coal, like this piece here, which is why we call it the Carboniferous period. Okay, but when we're talking about fossils, you want to hear about dinosaurs. This is a fragment of a dinosaur's rib. Now, it doesn't look like a rib. Um, you have to find it in context with other pieces to determine uh, what it is. Uh, you have to rely on the shape to determine what it is. Often when paleontologists find fossils, they, again, have to piece them back together. So paleontologists spend a lot of time solving puzzles. Here's George, our dinosaur. And again, if you look carefully at his, his large bones, you can see they're all cracked up. They've been filled in with plaster or glue. Uh, so again, we very, very rarely find an entire bone this large intact. Instead, we have to piece them back together. And in fact, with a dinosaur like this, we very rarely find all the bones in one place. Often a dinosaur is missing a leg or a tail. Uh, in the case of George, uh, he's actually a, com a combination of many, many different dinosaurs, all smushed together. 
fact, uh, when he was assembled in the 1950s, they took the head from one gender of dinosaur and the body from another gender of dinosaur. So George is also Georgette. Uh, he has two genders. Uh, George was found in Alberta in the 1920s, assembled in Ottawa in the 1950s, and then arrived at UBC uh, in the 1970s. So I, I really enjoy that photograph of George just driving down the highway. Uh, when they put him in, into the museum, there was actually no museum here at the time. They uh, had to finish building the building around him. So he won't be going anywhere anytime soon. Oh, and we were asked about the foot that's on display at the BD. This is the replica of that foot. Awesome. Uh, so I do have a question to ask in a second, but I did want to say this picture is really cool. This, this old picture from the 70s, I've never seen that before. Um, so there was a question earlier about dinosaurs. Uh, how many dinosaurs are there? And uh, do you happen to know like a recent discovery or the most recently discovered? Oh, that's a great question. I have no idea how many dinosaurs there are. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if you're asking like how many dinosaurs were there period or how many dinosaurs do we know about? Because we're always finding brand new dinosaurs. Um, again, just like the question with rock story, I feel like I'm repeating this a few times, uh, but it really also depends on who you talk about. Academics love to argue. Um, so some academics will say, some scientists will say uh, that George belongs to a group called hadrosaurs. Well, George does belong to a group called hadrosaurs, uh, but then you can split that group really finely. Um, sometimes we debate whether um, two different specimens are uh, two different species or if one specimen is just um, a juvenile or a young version of, an, of another species. Uh, sometimes, as Kashifa will tell you, um, animals will change dramatically as they mature. So if we see a, a small version of a dinosaur, which looks similar to a larger version, it's tough to tell whether that's a, a fully grown um, a, a specimen or if it's just a juvenile version of another specimen. So we're constantly arguing about that. Um, I do know that there's a bias in paleontology. We tend to emphasize the larger dinosaurs over the smaller dinosaurs. And that's for two main reasons. Uh, first of all, museums love to show big dinosaurs because they bring the crowds in. Everyone loves a big dinosaur. Um, but also, it's easy to find this. Like, if you're, you're walking along and this is sticking out of the ground, you really have to work hard to miss that. Whereas if you have a dinosaur that's only the size of a mouse, um, you have to work a lot harder to, to find that. So uh, there is a bias toward the large dinosaurs. Uh, but they probably had the same range of diversity that we, we see today. Absolutely. I just wanted to add two quick little things. Um, so what you said about uh, dinosaurs looking different, different stages, the Lambiosaurus is a great example because the juveniles, the females and the males all look different. And uh, for, for the Lambiosaurus and other relatives that do this, um, when they were first discovered, they were thought to be three separate things until it was realized that they were actually the same species, um, just three different stages. Um, and I will admit I did quickly Google and it looks, it looks like the current consensus is somewhere between 600 to 700 species of dinosaurs have been found. Uh, but like, like Daniel says, uh, it, it, it does change all the time. We're finding new things. We're also going back and like reclassifying old things and realizing that they were actually fewer um, than initially thought. So, but it seems like around six to 700 is the current estimate. Thanks. That, that, that I actually didn't know that myself. So it's <laughs> good to know that. And we got a, a, a wow, so cool oh. response to that. Um, so yeah, thanks. Um, I should mention also, uh, one thing you always want to look at with the dinosaur, one of the first things uh, paleontologists look at are their teeth uh, to determine what their diet likely would have been. If they've got dull teeth, they're probably plant eaters. If they've got sharp teeth, they were probably meat eaters. If they've got both like we do, um, they were probably omnivores where they ate both plants and meat. But uh, hadrosaur teeth or uh, lambiosaur teeth are very, very interesting. Uh, one of our researchers here, uh, Kirsten Brink, um, did her PhD in paleontology and then loved looking at the, the evolution of teeth so much, she went back and did a postdoc degree in dentistry. 
Um, and she researched hadrosaur teeth and realized that they were constantly growing brand new teeth. They were grinding up their food, which is very hard on your teeth. Um, ask any dentist and it's not good to grind your teeth. Uh, but because they were grinding up their teeth and wearing them down, they were constantly growing brand new teeth, like a conveyor belt uh, or like a beaver. So we're learning so much about uh, dinosaurs. Um, it's amazing when you can cross disciplines like that um, in some really unexpected ways. Oh, this is one of my favorite specimens in the museum. This is a gastrolith. Now, gastrolith isn't a word we often hear about. Um, some dinosaurs, unlike the hadrosaur, were actually very bad chewers. They would rip off lots of plant material and swallow it whole, or they would take big chunks of other dinosaurs and swallow it without really grinding it up. And that's a recipe for indigestion. Um, your stomach acid will digest your food for you, but you have to give it some help. You have to grind up that food so that there, there's more surface area uh, for the stomach acid to attack that food. So because some dinosaurs were such bad chewers, they would also swallow rocks like this one. And those rocks would tumble around inside their stomach, grinding up their food for them. So it's kind of like um, a tummy tooth. And as these rocks rolled around inside the stomach, uh, they would chip off the rough edges. The stomach acid would help polish these rocks. Uh, so it's kind of like having a rock tumbler inside your tummy. So that's what we have here. And you can tell you've got a gastrolith if you find a rock in one location, which doesn't match the rocks in that location. Uh, if you know that this type of rock is found in a different area, a different part of the province, um, you know the migration patterns of that dinosaur. So that's really cool. Uh, sometimes you'll find these rocks actually inside the rib cage of a dinosaur fossil. So then you really know that that dinosaur had uh, these gastroliths inside them. Now to make this specimen extra cool, you can look at these oval marks here and over here. These are actually other fossils. So hundreds of millions of years uh, er earlier, the area where this rock was formed was an ancient seabed and animals like these belemnites were swimming around and as every living thing does, they died. After they died, they were fossilized and captured in this rock. Millions of years later, that sea dried up, a dinosaur came along, found this fossil, ate it, and turned it into a gastrolith. So this specimen actually tells us two stories in one, that of the belemnites and of the dinosaur. So I really love this specimen. I'll take you next to ammonites. Ammonites are also a really common version of fossil. Here are some excellent ammonites from Haida Gwaii. Now they look like snails, but ammonites are actually the ancestors of octopi and squid. They were ferocious predators that would swim around ancient oceans eating other things. Ammonites are incredibly diverse. Uh, most are curled up like this one. But you also have some local ones, which were really bizarrely shaped. Uh, this is a, an ammonite from uh, Hornby Island. And because it's from Hornby Island, it's actually named after Hornby Island. It's the Nostoceras hornbyensis. And they were shaped like trombones or paper clips. So it's a really strange version of an ammonite. Uh, other ammonites were simply cone-shaped, going straight up and down. Can you see it now? How the tentacles would stick up the end? Over here. This is one of the specimens that we use uh, in our school field trips. Um, and I love this specimen as well because you can see the outside petrified or is turned into rock, but it turned into rock so fast that the inside stayed hollow. This one wasn't crushed. And so because the inside was hollow, as more minerals started to seep into this hollow shell, the minerals had space to deposit themselves in their most natural form uh, as crystals. And so the crystals filled in the inside of the seashell, making both a geode in, a, and a fossil at the same time. Oh, 
Ammonites, uh, again, aren't very rare. They're found all over the earth and they, we've known about them for a long, long time. There are a lot of legends that go with Ammonites. Uh, some people say that um, uh, when St. Patrick expelled the snakes from Ireland, um, they, they say that that legend comes from the fact that Ireland has a lot of Ammonite shells. You can see how these could be interpreted as snakes. The name actually comes to us from ancient Egypt. Egyptians found these curled up shells and thought that they were the horns of their god Ammon. And that's why we have the name Ammonites. What is rare though, is that sometimes Ammonites uh, will have their shells preserved in such a way that they get transformed into the rarest gem on earth. And that's what we see here. This is an Ammonite shell that's been transformed into Amalite. And Amalite is only found uh, in Western Canada. So this is a piece of Amalite on display in our gallery. It's about the size of a di dinner plate. Okay, I'll go into our last specimen uh, before taking some questions. This is one of our newest displays. This is the elasmosaur. Uh, so uh, this is a replica specimen. Uh, it's not the original fossil. Uh, if it were the real fossil, it would be way too heavy to hold up with just a few wires, you can see here, um, because it would be rock. Instead, this is a fiberglass cast. Uh, this is a replica of the very first elasmosaur ever discovered. It was found in the 1800s in Kansas, and so because our elasmosaur is not in Kansas anymore, we've decided to name her Dorothy. That being said, elasmosaurs have been found here in BC. Uh, there's one on display in the Courtney Museum. But elasmosaurs had a huge range. Recently, we found a, an elasmosaur in Antarctica. So they reached from BC all the way uh, to the South Pole. Now, when the elasmosaur was first discovered, the paleontologist who found it put its skull on its tail. And you can understand why. This is really an absurd creature. It's got a bizarrely long neck. But closer examination realized that the vertebra in the neck uh, are neck vertebra. They're very different from the tail vertebra. And so uh, within a few years, uh, those early paleontologists were able to determine that this is actually how this animal should look. About half of the body is neck. Now, why was this animal so bizarrely shaped? Well, again, you want to look at the teeth. The elasmosaur has some very uh, sharp, pointy teeth, and we believe that that was to eat fish. So schools of fish would look through the murky waters of ancient oceans and see the body, and they would keep what they thought was a safe distance from what they would recognize as a predator's body. But a safe distance is very different from a normal sized neck versus the elasmosaur's um, half, half body length of neck. I believe it's four and a half meters of neck. So it's quite long. So the elasmosaur could park its body in one location and use this long neck to clear out vast quantities of, of fish with very little effort and the fish wouldn't swim away. Okay, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Um, so just some com. Um, I'll share the question first, and we'll do the comments. So Jessica from uh, on Facebook is asking. So there, this is a question about the gastrolith. Mm -hmm. um, how big is the gastrolith that you have? Uh, it's a little about the size of a fist, maybe a little smaller. Okay. Um, do you think that it would give them like a belly ache? No, no, because that's how they had evolved. Um, and again, these are big, big dinosaurs. Uh, so if you think of like an Apatosaurus um, with its huge, with its huge body, uh, it's fine to swallow that that material. And every now and then, they would also vomit up gastroliths when they were too smooth and weren't weren't really doing anything. Um, they were fine with that. Uh, awesome. And I just wanted to just share some comments. So um, earlier we were asked about dinosaurs and also asked about recent discoveries. Mm -hmm. And so Sheila shared uh, the Ankylosaurus that was found in northern BC mm. not that long ago. Um, it's uh, part of it is at uh, on display at the Royal BC Museum in Victoria. 
Um, I think it was actually discovered a long time ago, but it was only recently recognized, but it's still really cool. It's a local dinosaur. Um, and just a, a few comments from Catherine. I think when you're showing ammonites, you mentioned that uh, they are her favorites. Uh, and then also saying that amylite is very expensive. Um, and jewelry from it is very expensive. And then also uh, she says heads or tails, question mark, when showed the Elasmosaurus, which I think is perhaps, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could flip um, a coin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, that's the contrast is quite amazing. Um, awesome, so we're, we're good for now. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Let's head into our next section, Earth's treasures. So this is our mineral hallway at the PME. Um, Earth produces a huge number of treasures, um, not just gems and, and jewels, but also just everyday stuff that we use uh, in our, our society. Minerals. So let's take a look at how we define a mineral. Um, yeah, so minerals are solids. Uh, they are not liquids or gases. They are inorganic, so they are not alive and they are not from living things. There's some gray area with that definition or with that point, uh, but technically, um, if something comes from a living organism, it uh, gets kicked out of the mineral club. And then they're consistently the same. Scientists will say that they have a repeating crystal structure, but that's just the way of saying that it's the same throughout. Uh, so if it changes drastically, uh, then you've got a different mineral which is attached itself to your, the mineral that you're studying. So here we have a nice cityscape. This is downtown Vancouver. It's nice to see the sidewalks crowded. I kind of miss that. Um, <laughs> but let's just see in the comments, can anyone tell me anything in this photograph that is made from minerals? I'll see if I can get my chat open. Yeah, I will also read it out loud. So Catherine is saying the phone. The phone, the phone uh, itself, absolutely. Yeah, uh, the road. The road, yeah. Uh, the lights or the, the street lights? The street lights, certainly. Uh, the bikes. The bikes, absolutely. The, bicy the bicy bicycle wheels. Awesome. So minerals are incredibly useful. Uh, we depend on them for our everyday lives. Um, whoever said the phone, I'm really happy you said that. Whatever device you're, you're viewing this on is made of minerals. So let's take a look at some of our really impressive minerals uh, our, from our gems, Golden Gems Gallery. So here we have some gold and gold is really, really interesting. Uh, Gold tends to collect together in Earth's crust at times when the Earth is going through, um, uh, um, is creating supercontinents. Uh, you get fragmentation in the bedrock, which allows hydrothermal vents to carry the gold uh, into the vents and allows it to deposit. Uh, now, I'll admit, when gold is in its natural state like this, it's often very unattractive. Um, it's not as pretty as something like, say, fool's gold. Uh, in real life, this kind of looks like mustard smeared on a rock. Uh, when you get it out of the rock, though, it can be very attractive. This is some more native gold uh, from our gem gallery. So this is gold that came together in its pure form naturally. Gold is incredibly useful. Uh, so here's the James Webb Telescope. It's about to be launched by NASA. Uh, with help from some Canadian scientists uh, in a few months, I believe. I believe it's supposed to go up within the year. Uh, and it's supposed to reveal some of the secrets of our galaxy. And you can see that it's got a very prominent gold sail, a, a gold um, receiving dish. The electronics uh, that you're using right now contain some gold. Your cell phone contains some gold. Your computer contains some gold. Uh, your car, uh, the bus probably contains some gold as well. Now it's not enough that I'd recommend you crack open your cell phone or crack open your computer and try and get the gold out. It's just a small amount. Uh, but there are some people who will take old electronics after they've lived their lives, uh, served their usefulness, and these people will then take the uh, valuable minerals out of these electronics and try and recycle them. And that's a far more environmentally friendly way of getting minerals um, than mining for brand new ones. 
why send gold to the trash um, when we can just take it out of our electronics? This person looks like a space alien or a character on Doctor Who, but they're actually uh, someone from Earth. This is a volcanologist, someone who studies volcanoes. Studying volcanoes, you get exposed to a lot of heat, a lot of gases. Uh, to protect them, volcanologists have these fancy suits. These suits are very um, insulative. They keep a lot of the heat out, but they really struggle to keep the heat out around the face. So volcanologists will use these fancy face shields with gold uh, embedded in them to reflect a lot of the heat and radiation from the volcano. And then of course, we all know about gold as a decorative uh, metal. So of course, when you win the Olympics, you get a gold medal. <laughs> Here's another uh, gem that we often talk about, the ruby. Now, again, in its natural state, Rubies aren't terribly attractive. These are some rubies that we have from Myanmar. You have to really work with them and polish them uh, and put effort into them to make them really shine and be truly jaw-dropping. Uh, rubies are a prized gemstone, partially because of how beautiful they are, but also because of how hard they are. We all know that diamonds are the hardest rock on earth, uh, but rubies are the second hardest, coming in at nine on the Mohs scale of hardness. Here are some Colombian emeralds uh, still embedded in their rock. And again, emeralds aren't the most attractive of when they come out of the planet, but if you put some work and effort into them, they really do look stunning, like with this necklace designed for the Romanovs. Now, as beautiful as these gemstones are, we also have to recognize that often uh, they can be removed under some terrible circumstances. Even today, uh, many of the mines that we have on, on this planet are, are, do try to be ethical and uh, protect the environment, but uh, in many countries today, there are still places where uh, workers are paid uh, less than subsistence wages, uh, where these mines destroy the local environment, um, where children are put to work. So we really do have to keep that in, in our mind when we're purchasing these kinds of gemstones, where they came from, and if we're supporting um, something that we uh, ethically support ourselves. Now, just as uh, rubies and emeralds may not look the nicest when they come out of the ground, there's some other rocks which come out of the ground looking just stunning, like quartz. So this is a natural quartz crystal. This wasn't carved. Here's another one. I love quartz, partially because it's one of the most diverse minerals that we have. It's one of the mo most common minerals, but it's also incredibly diverse. You can have clear quartz like this one. You can have purple quartz over here. We've got some yellow quartz, uh, it's blurry in the background. We've got some pink quartz over here. You can polish it up so that it looks like a diamond, although it is much softer than a diamond. Quartz, because it is one of the most common minerals on earth, um, has one of the most common crystal structures. When we think of crystals, we think of this, right? A long hexagonal shaft. But different minerals produce drastically different crystals. This is a natural pyrite crystal. It comes naturally as a cube. So this crystal wasn't carved. This is how it came out of the ground, as a perfect cube. I don't know for sure where this specimen comes from, but I believe it's from Spain. Uh, Spain is famous for producing uh, really pristine cubic crystals. Here you can see that cubic crystal structure a little more clearly. Here's a bunch of pyrite crystals which mushed themselves together, they grew together. And you can really see a, a curious uh, feature of pyrite crystals, the grain. So you can see the lines on this side of the crystal. On this face, they go in this direction, but over here, the lines go in this direction. Pyrite crystals change their grains on each face. Every time you turn that, the lines change direction, which I find just fascinating. Now, pyrite is truly a stunning mineral, and it looks like something that we just talked about. It looks like gold. Many early explorers would load their boats up with uh, 
pyrite samples and take them back to Europe. And they'd be very excited thinking they found lots and lots of gold, only to be informed later on that they'd found the far less valuable pyrite. And so today we know pyrite as fool's gold. So if you need help remembering that, when you run into pyrites, don't give them your real gold, give them your pyrite, your fool's gold. I love that how you just snuck that in there. <laughs> um, uh, we do have some questions. Is now a good time or do you want to wait a little bit? Uh, sure, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, I just wanted to just go back uh, a little bit when you were talking, when you were showing that picture uh, of the minerals, the, the sorry, the picture of the road and we were looking at all the different minerals. There's a question uh, about whether streetlights are made of plastic and if plastic is a mineral. Ah. Oh, good question. I don't, um, like the covers on the streetlights? Um, maybe the actual, the light itself. I mean, plastic comes from oil. So. Yeah, that, that is a great question. And I think, again, this is one of those things where geologists could debate for a long time. Uh, I know there's some debate over glass because, um, remember I was saying that the definition of mineral is that it has a repeating crystal structure. Uh, glass. I believe doesn't actually have a crystal structure because it cools down so fast. So it can be kicked out of the mineral club. Um, other people do classify it as a mineral. Um, just, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Um, we have a few more questions. You showed that great uh, photo of the volcanologist. Mm -hmm. um, what the, the question is, what was the volcano suit made of? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I don't know. My director is a volcanologist, so she's always excited to sneak in some vo volcano uh, content. <laughs> um, I assume it's, it's probably got a lot of padding. Um, it's probably just a really souped up North Face jacket. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the high tech insulation again uh, is probably opaque. And so if you put it over your face, you just, you'd be walking blind. And you don't want to walk blind in front of an open volcano because uh, that's how you die. Hi, uh, there you go. Uh, Nancy did say, um, uh, is, is she's just sharing uh, some information she found. So she said that fire proximity suits uh, were originally made of asbestos, mm. but nowadays they're made from vacuum deposited uh, alminized materials. So there we great. go. Yeah, I, would, no. yeah, I, I should have guessed asbestos because um, even though we have this negative connotation with asbestos, it really was viewed as a miracle mineral for a long, long time. Um, I wish I had I'd left in my asbestos slides because it's such a freaky and cool mineral. It looks like a cheap wig. Um, I, I always say that I'm originally from Winnipeg um, and many of our early homes were insulated with newspapers or sawdust. And in the winter, it gets down to minus 40. So you can imagine spending a winter in a home with that kind of insulation. Uh, you can also imagine if a small fire broke out in that kind of home, uh, that building wouldn't last very long. So when they found asbestos and realized that it was insulative and didn't burn, uh, they rushed to stuff their homes with it. Uh, there you go. And of course, now we know it's quite dangerous. Yes. Um, <laughs> there's a question about rubies. Uh, yeah. do, don't rubies need high heat as well to be formed? That's a great question. I'm not actually up to date with rubies. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised um, if they have to go through an extreme heat and pressure just because of um, how hard they are, but I can't state that for certain. Okay, no worries. Uh, oh, she's saying uh, to be pretty. I guess the rubies need to go undergo high heat. To be yeah, well, like you can see with this photograph, uh, there's a huge diversity of coloring of, of rubies. So um, I, I, if you say that, I would believe it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the deepest reds, the most vibrant reds are from pieces that have undergone more heat and pressure. There you go. Uh, two more questions for now. Uh, there's a question about pyrite. Yeah. So how does pyrite have such perfect lines? Oh, often it doesn't. So the reason why I can uh, fairly confidently say that this comes from Spain is because this is incredibly rare. This is the idealized shape uh, for pyrite. Often you get um, pyrite forming under less than ideal circumstances. Again, 
even though this is less than ideal, it's still pretty um, fairly ideal. Uh, but pyrite will often get um, interfered with as it's growing its crystal, and you won't get these perfect lines. Um, if you look up pyrite dollar, you'll see what happens when pyrite tries to, to form between uh, two layers of rock, which are smushing down on it, and the pyrite has to grow outward, and it actually looks like a sand dollar. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, one more question for now. Sheila is um, saying glass is about uh, is is about seventy five percent quartz? Question mark. Uh, would that qualify as mineral or just a rock? I, well, again, that's where you get that debate, because <laughs> it does contain mineral, uh, but if there's no crystal in the glass, then there's no repeating crystal structure. So um, some geologists who, are, who um, aren't as strict say, yeah, glass can be a mineral. Uh, others who are very, you know, by the books uh, say that glass isn't a mineral. So uh, it's not quite as cut and dried as we like to pretend it is. Awesome. Uh, so we're, we're good with questions for now, Daniel. Just wanted to give you a heads up. It is 1.53. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is one of my favorite minerals. This is gypsum. And gypsum belongs to a, a classification of minerals called evaporates. Evaporates are minerals which can be dissolved into water. Um, but then when the water evaporates, um, the mineral gets left behind and has a chance to form crystals. So this is a, a gypsum rose uh, from Winnipeg. Uh, again, my home city, and they found a lot of gypsum crystals like this one in the 1950s when they were digging the moat around that city. You've got a very common evaporate in your kitchen, uh, halite or halite, and this is a photograph of some halite from my kitchen. Uh, you may know it by another name, salt. And so again, you can imagine, you can dissolve salt into water, um, and then when you evaporate that water, you don't get salt air, uh, you get salt crystals left behind. And again, when we're done, go to your kitchen, take a close look at salt. You'll see that it has that perfect cubic structure that we saw with pyrite. Okay. I'm gonna move quickly into our, our final section, our powerful planet. Our planet does have a lot of power. Um, our planet's surface is not one solid piece, as we often think it is. Instead, it's a bunch of smaller pieces, uh, tectonic plates, which are constantly in motion, bumping and grinding their way over the surface of our planet. And where we live here in Vancouver, two of those pieces are actually crashing into each other. We've got the tiny Juan de Fuca plate uh, crashing into the much larger North American plate and sliding underneath it. If that movement is fast, we can get an earthquake. Uh, if the crash is extremely violent, you can crack those plates. And if you crack the surface of our planet, you will get a volcano. You will create space for magma to escape uh, from beneath those plates. Now, the volcanoes that we have in this part of the planet are extremely flamboyant. Uh, they put on a great show, and that's because our volcanoes here are incredibly gassy. Again, the Juan de Fuca plate is sliding underneath the much larger North American plate. The Juan de Fuca plate is an, an oceanic plate, and so as it slides down, it's bringing with it lots and lots of water. As that water encounters the magma uh, under the surface of our planet, it gets heated up, it boils, and it turns into gas. That gas gets into the magma, which fuels our volcanoes. So our volcanoes are containers of highly pressurized gassy liquid. And when you relieve the pressure on a container of highly pressurized gassy liquid, uh, you get a great show. Uh, it tends to erupt very flamboyantly. We've got containers of highly pressurized gassy liquids in our homes right now. Pop and soda. So you can imagine when you shake up a can of pop and then you relieve the pressure by opening it, it goes everywhere, it explodes. And that's what happens to our volcanoes. When their pressure is relieved, they erupt everywhere. And that's what happened with Mount St. Helens when it erupted in the 1980s. This is what Mount St. Helens looked like uh, before the eruption. And afterward, about a third of the mountain was blown away. So here again, you can see it from a different angle. Now, because our volcanoes are so gassy, uh, one thing that our volcanologists do uh, to determine if a volcano is about to erupt is they will take uh, gas samples from the volcano. 
cracks and crevices will, will open up in the volcano, on the volcano sides, and gas will start to seep out. So volcanologists can actually sample that gas. The volcano itself will actually start to inflate, like the volcano is taking a deep breath. And so uh, satellites can actually measure the size of a volcano. If it's suddenly growing, we know that it's filling up with gas and potentially getting ready to erupt. Uh, a couple of years ago, some volcanoes in northern B BC started to expand, like they were inhaling and getting ready to erupt. And so we started to think that maybe these volcanoes uh, might erupt in the near future. We put some monitoring stations on those volcanoes' sides uh, just to make sure they wouldn't erupt. Here's another impressive natural disaster, asteroids. Meteorites, things from space. So this is the asteroid Bennu. Uh, NASA is actually looking to land a probe on Bennu and return some of the samples uh, that it'll, it'll collect from that asteroid back to our planet. Now, the exterior of this asteroid is mostly uh, just soft material. If it were to enter our atmosphere, most of that soft material would burn up. But a small amount of metallic core might reach the surface of our planet, and that would be a meteorite. Now, I should mention, asteroids and meteorites are very different from comets, like the one we had in our skies this summer. Comets instead are made of uh, ice and gas and dust. And so when they get close to the sun, they start to heat up, and that ice and gas and dust will start to melt and leave behind this beautiful tail. But you don't get that tail with uh, asteroids or meteorites because uh, they're made of rock and metal. When these things land on our planet, uh, we can slice them open and look at the inside of the meteorites. And I was talking about crystal patterns earlier. The insides of meteorites often have this very beautiful, very detailed uh, cross-hatching pattern in the metal. This is called the Widmannstaaten pattern. And using a bit of acid to treat the surface of this, this uh, meteorite, you can raise up the pattern and it's just stunning. I encourage you to look up Widman Schatten patterns. Uh, you could just gaze at them for days and days. This is one of the specimens in our collection. Uh, it was collected, I believe, in Tunisia. Our final section is the Omniglobe, and unfortunately I can't show you the Omniglobe uh, via Zoom just because animations uh, tend to bog Zoom down. But the Omniglobe is a spherical screen, and it can show you information about Earth, the Moon, Mars, other planets. It can show you movement of the oceans or the atmosphere, uh, migrations of uh, people uh, historically. Um, yeah, and so when we do reopen, I encourage all of you to come by, play with the Omniglobe, uh, check out our gem gallery, which is behind it, uh, check out George, our dinosaur, all our specimens, and if you see me in the gallery, feel free to ask me your questions. Awesome. So uh, we have uh, a few comments about rubies, because we were discussing them earlier. Um, Jessica on Facebook said that um, she thinks that the raw, unpolished gems are also beautiful. Um, <laughs> and then we've got some agreement. Catherine says she owns, uh, owns some raw rubies. Um, and Nancy's commenting that they look like candy. <laughs> so, lots of positive connotations with the raw rubies. Uh, there's a really good question about volcanoes. Uh, could a volcano erupt in BC? Ah, yes. <laughs> um, like I was saying before, uh, we thought that a couple of volcanoes in northern BC were about to erupt a couple of years ago. I don't believe that they did. Uh, we do have a lot of volcanoes here in BC, uh, but um, none of the, vol the volcanoes are close enough to a place like Vancouver um, or major settlements that they pose much of a risk. As flamboyant as our volcanoes are, when they erupt, they tend to cause very localized damage. Um, they don't tend to, um, you know, they won't wipe out all of BC. They may just cause some damage in the area. Uh, we may get dirty if a volcano erupts in this province where some of the ash blows into our city, uh, but we don't have to worry about a volcano destroying Vancouver. Uh, the closest volcano is actually far enough away that, that it's safe. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Um, a lot of our local mountains, this was new to me a couple of years ago, um, Mount Garibaldi, I did not know was a volcano and Mount Baker, which is 
in Washington, but still visible. Yeah. Uh, uh, the chief in Squamish is actually um, a failed volcano. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. the solidified magma chamber of an ancient volcano. Uh, so th the volcano filled up with magma. Uh, then it just sat there for a long time, failed to erupt. The outside of the volcano eroded away. And now we're left with this um, unerupted heart of the volcano that you can hike up today. There you go. Awesome. So uh, if anyone has any last questions, any comments, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And I agree. The um, unpolished rubies are very attractive. It's just they aren't what you think of when you think of rubies. <laughs> very true. Uh, OK. So we, have a we had a comment just saying this is very fun. Oh, and thanks. So Daniel, thank you <laughs> for your awesome presentation. Sheila agrees. She says, awesome presentation. Thank you. We have a thank you from Arnold. Um, Thanks, everyone. I, I really enjoyed your questions. Uh, this has been really useful for me. Um, we're trying to get this tour out to uh, schools for, this, for the school term. And so um, I've been very nervous about it because I don't know how school children are going to react. But practicing it with people like you, uh, great audiences like you, really calms my nerves and helps me um, chip off the rough edges, just like the gastrolith got its rough edges chipped down and got it polished into the beautiful gastrolith that I showed you today. Awesome. Uh, Arnold is just adding that um, your tour made him want to visit the PME. Oh, thank you. So. Um, so thank yous, lots of thank yous. Uh, all right, so if there, uh, if there are no more questions, then we are going to start uh, wrapping up our, our program today. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us um, and for your wonderful questions and comments. Of course, thank you, Daniel. You did such a, such a wonderful job. I learned a lot. Um, and just letting everybody know that we do BD at Home every Wednesday at 1 p.m. So next week, uh, we're going to have one of our museum interpreters, Vincent, do a tour of the museum. Um, so you can, uh, you can join us uh, for that. Um, other than that, uh, we'll be wrapping up. So thank you very much.